Welcome, my name is Rashra Lamy. I'm one of the incoming deputy editors at JAG, and it's my absolute pleasure today to be joined by one of my colleagues from the UK, Professor Devaka Pereira from King's College. Devaka, thank you so much for sending a very important analysis to Jack. Uh, we have been watching uh, as the results of Revived have unfolded and the criticism has come in. And it was fantastic to be able to publish probably one of the most important sub-studies, uh, the sub-study looking at completeness of revascularization in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy and how that might have had an impact on the results of Revive. So maybe, Devaka, you could start by telling us a little bit about why you thought this, this analysis was important. Thank you, Rasha. And if I could start by thanking you and, and Jack for you know, publishing the paper and for working with us on the paper to get it to where it is and for taking time to talk to me today. So I, I agree with you. I think this is perhaps the most important paper to, to be published on, on Revived since our original results. And that's because it speaks to a lot of the questions that were raised in, in the wake of the, the first presentation. Questions like, what was there really a lot of coronary artery disease? If you remember, uh, you know, th there was confusion about the one vessel, two vessel, three vessel disease. We used the BCIS Jeopardy score, which maybe people weren't familiar with. Uh, what, what was the syntax score? Um, a, lot of people, a lot of operators are more experienced with the syntax score. So we needed, needed those answers. The second question was how much revask was actually done uh, and did we achieve complete revask and had, if not, would there have been a different answer if we had achieved complete revask? So was the PCI of sufficient quality and did it fit with, with contemporary practice? So we had to answer all of those questions and all of those answers are, are, are coming out now, um, you know, at EuroPCI and, and in the Jack paper. So what we did was, we thought we'd use independent core laboratories to analyze all of the, the data. So the angiograms were, were sent to Glasgow. They were blinded to the, the all of the clinical results and, and, and outcomes. And they analyzed it in terms of syntax score, the baseline jeopardy score, and completeness of revascularization in the group that, that underwent PCI. In parallel, we had the, the cardiac MRI scans analyzed by uh, an independent core lab who were then able to do a segmental analysis and say which segments were uh, were scarred, partially scarred, uh, you know, normally functioning, et cetera. And that allowed us to co-register the coronary anatomy with the, the myocardial segments that they, they subtended. And combining those two outputs, we could then tell, we could then explain uh, the amount of disease that, that, that was present at the start. And by the way, we found that there really was extensive coronary disease, and this was complex disease. More than 50% of the patients had at least one CTO. More than 50% of the patients had at least one vessel, which was deemed to have extensive calcification. So this will reassure the interventional cardiologist or, 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 or sort of confirm that this is a complex coronary subset. The next thing we were able to do was to look at the amount of coronary disease that was present at the start, and then describe the, the completeness of Revask in terms of the change that was made. So the change in syntax score, the change in BCIS Jeopardy score as a proportion of the baseline amount of coronary disease. And that index uh, we've described as the, the, the coronary revascularization index, RI coronary. But actually for the myocardium, it's really what uh, is downstream of the coronaries that's important. So in that, we describe the amount of viable segments that were subtended by diseased vessels that were revascularized. So myocardial revascularization rather than coronary revascularization. And that then allowed us to describe the, the whole picture. So based on that, here are the results. The, the, the median completeness of revascularization, anatomical completeness of revascularization was 67% actually really close to what was reported by the site and what, what we had reported in the New England Journal of Medicine paper. So that was reassuring that the core lab and site reported reads were, were similar. And when we dichotomize patients as having more than the median, more than 67% or less than, and we call that complete or incomplete revascularization, and then compared it to, to patients who had medical therapy, there was no difference in the outcomes. Uh, you know, the Kaplan Myers were, were pretty close and uh, the hazard ratios were, were, you know, not far off one. 
We also wanted to look at it in more, more detail and rather than just dichotomizing it, looked at it as a continuous variable. And when we did, we got I got pretty excited because at first glance, it looked like there was an association between the completeness of anatomical revascularization as a continuous variable and outcomes. But actually, there are many reasons why operators choose to, to carry out complete or incomplete revascular. And one of those is whether uh, the, a, a CTO, for instance, subtends completely infarcted myocardium. Once you correct for those factors, including viability, then that association was lost. And that correction, which in this case is a statistical correction, we also did in a, in a sort of clinical manner by, by considering the myocardial segments. So that's where the RI myo comes into account. Once again, once you dichotomize patients by the median, median RI myo was 85%, by the way. So the operators met the brief of the protocol to try and revascularize all viable uh, territories. Dichotomized above or below 85%, the outcomes are no different to optimal medical therapy alone. So this really answers a, a lot of those questions and, you know, adds more weight, I think, to the original revived findings. Um, and I think will probably be practice changing. So thank you so much, Savarka, for summarizing the trials. But I'm now going to uh, ask you just to kind of answer probably some of the criticism that may come. So... Completeness of revascularization is such a tricky definition and not one that's standardized. And obviously you and your team did your best to come up with two pretty, you know, uh, what on the face of it, um, very uh, practical indices to think about completeness of revascularization. Do you think these are indices we can use in clinical practice? What do you see as the pros and cons of this approach? So I, I think they are actually quite readily used in, in clinical practice, certainly um, the, the coronary revascularization index. And in patients who have preserved left ventricular function, I think that's that's probably a, 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 a pretty robust index to, to use to quantify the completeness of revascularization. You, you use any method of classifying the extent of coronary disease. That could be the BCIS Jeopardy score, which we, we've used in several trials. It could be the Syntax score. And you just simply look at the change as a proportion of the baseline. That's pretty easy to use, pretty easy to calculate uh, in, in, a, in the back of a cat lab once you've done the procedure. RI myo is a little bit harder to do because you're then combining two different modalities and geography and something like cardiac MRI. And you need to need to have a fairly robust way of, of um, co-registering them. So I think that will remain probably a research tool or we might use it in, in planning procedures to, to work out you know, how much revascular we're going to do. But I, I think it will probably be, remain a research tool. But as a research tool, I think it's really, really powerful. And I think that is the way we should go when assessing completeness of revascular and its impact in stable coronary artery disease. In our population who had impaired early function, it was driven by viability. But in a different population, it would be driven by ischemia. Yeah. Uh, you know, that classification, how many ischemic segments were, were revascularized. And interestingly, in the in the, the sort of completeness of revask analysis of ischemia, they also found that when you looked at functional completeness of revask, there wasn't that much difference between complete and partial revask. Yeah, so you bring us to that sort of functional question. So there may be some some people out there that say, well, you didn't tell us about pre and post PCI physiology, pre and post PCI intravascular imaging. Can you speak yeah. to that? Yeah, so uh, and I think that's that's a valid point. We we tried, as you know, when you're running a trial, you, you, there's always a balance between the perfect academic trial and a pragmatic one. And given the complexity of coronary disease, we knew there was a lot to to be done. We didn't burden our interventional cardiologist with any other study derived intracoronary physiology. But when devising the Jeopardy score, we've used a, a greater than seventy percent diameter stenosis, which actually uh, is different to the syntax score, for instance, which uses a 50% diameter stenosis. So the likelihood of us scoring significant disease was, was increased. But nevertheless, it isn't physiology. It's an anatomical surrogate of physiology. And that's, a, that's, a, that's definitely a limitation of not, not just our study, but many others that have based their, their inclusion criteria on angiographic appearances. So that, that is an issue. There was a lot of intracoronary imaging done, but we didn't systematically capture it. We didn't have an imaging core lab. So I don't know how um, you know those data may have 
um, kind of interacted with with outcomes. But nevertheless, I think we we have um, you know we we defined how we were going to uh, characterize patients for entry into the trial. And using that definition, we know how much change our intervention brought about. So I think we we have something that's very usable. Well, thank you, Devaka. I know uh, well how hard it is to conduct these trials, but even more importantly for you and the investigators to conduct a trial like this in such a comorbid, uh, high-risk population is really very tricky. Maybe I can give you the final word. So in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy now, what are you doing in your clinical practice? Well, we don't routinely offer revascularization, which actually before revive was something that 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 I used to do. Uh, if a patient, whether they had angina or not, if they had angina, it was it's pretty easy. You're doing it for a different reason. It's to improve that symptom. But if they didn't have angina but had evidence of lots of viability, we would routinely offer revascularization, and that no longer is is the case. Um, there are still some patients who in whom we would would consider revascularization, like the patient with angina. And if it is a patient with angina whom you're taking to the lab, then maybe trying to treat every single vessel is no, no longer indicated. It may be that we use the same approach that we do for patients with preserved LV function. You treat the biggest amount of myocardial territory, see whether their symptoms improve and take a staged approach. So I think we can now, we have the confidence to move away from this this uh, perception that if you take someone to the lab, you cannot leave the lab without treating every single proximal coronary lesion. Thank you, Devaka. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. And um, we very much look forward to reading your results in Jack. Um, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to ask some more questions. Thanks, Roshan.